Um, I was wondering how you guys fared in your rereading or first time reading. Yeah, this was a first time reading for me. Um, and, you know, you, you had mentioned that at our last get together, hey, we should do this. And, and I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll, I'll get started now. And so I, I just kind of had a, a leisurely read through from then, you know, did, did an issue or two every week. And uh, so I, I felt I felt like I was pretty good with my homework. Yeah. I mean, did you say you had the issues before, but you had just never read them? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I've got, I, um, mo most of my comics at this point, I, I don't really read anymore because I'm afraid to touch them, but, but I saved my Captain Victory because they haven't been collected yet. I saved my 2001s because <laughs> yeah. they haven't been collected yet. And I saved my Justice Inc. Um, and so that, that's kind of my, my stack of comics to read. <laughs> So I, I, I actually don't know if I have them all. I, I have through issue 13 and a special, an annual. I saw one of the covers. It was the one at the top of your pile. I don't think that's the normal issue one cover. Yeah, this, is this, that? This is like a black and white. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a special edition. Okay, yeah, I don't have that. And Christopher, you said you had trouble finding some of the later ones? Yeah, I bought some of these maybe like 10 years or so ago when Dynamite was putting out Captain Victory. So I was curious to see what the original was like. So I read maybe like the first four, and then I tried to go out and find the rest, which was difficult, especially yeah. the later issues. Uh, like The last one was almost, I couldn't find it actually. I did manage to get a copy to read, but I could not find one to purchase for my own little collection here. But uh, I did manage to get through it. It wasn't a chore. I did manage to get through it. Yeah. Uh, I it, I read the first few uh, 10 years ago, and I liked them more the second time around because I read them sequentially as one read and I actually liked the, the first third of the story the best. But um, it, the quality varied, I would say. Well, we can talk about that. Uh, yeah. But I, yes, I, I did my homework and I did get through it. But it wasn't easy to find them. Yeah, I don't, you know, I felt like that was a little bit of a recent thing. You know, I... Mm -hmm. found the last few issues kind of easily so when you were like oh hey like I even had the last few issues like extra copies a few months back I gave them to someone who's curious about Kirby I wish I held on to them <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the Marvel movies everybody's yeah. just scrambling and there's a lot of speculation so I mean even the TV shows anything to do with Kang is hot so it's I think it's just a lot of that uh, people coming in and speculating that these will go up in value. And that's that kind of breaks my heart because I like people that really want to read them because that's why I want to jump on them and get them because I want to read books or mm -hmm. I want to read the comics. People buy them, slab them, and then put them online. It's like a 5.5 slab. I'm like, I don't care, you know? The plastic box fetishists. Yes. <laughs> there are books. I maintain that any of Jack Kirby's 1970s work in Captain Victory and Silver Star, that should be for everyone. That should mm -hmm. not be bagged and boarded. That should not be, well, bagged and boarded is fine, but it shouldn't be slabbed. Everyone should have access to them. You should be able to go in a comic shop, buy like one of these for like $2 and then just read it until it falls apart. Mm -hmm. I wish they were collected. I, I've considered like reaching out to a custom book binder just to have them like sewn together but i also like them in their pure comic book form so i don't want to ruin that either fewer companies are doing the book binding now there is one i forget the name of it and they were doing book binding and then like this is going to be our last run and it was in october last year so they're getting out of this they're getting out of the print i i really enjoyed rereading this and i'm glad you guys were down to do more homework and come and talk about it because captain victory is by far one of my favorite kirby things ever um, it makes me sad that he had to wait until the 1980s to do like his fully indie creator owned book where he can say whatever he wanted. Like, I think it's arguably his angriest comic mm. outside of like New Gods or OMAC, maybe. Yeah, uh, re researching this, that he uh, was responding in some regard to uh, Star Wars, George yeah. Lucas' Star Wars, feeling that George ripped him off <laughs> by reading the new guys. Now, I think most of George's stuff came from samurai movies and yeah. dogfights, so I don't, I don't know if that's true. 
but uh, he wanted to take a more realistic approach. Like aliens won't come like close encounters of the third kind and be like, hey, we want to be your friends and take you out to the stars. No, they're probably here for conquest. And he had and and for a book that had so much humor in it and lightness in it and goofiness in some places, it's a very dark subject, a very mm -hmm. dark take on uh, other races and other uh, species in outer space coming to us. My favorite part is the marketing on the books where on each cover, it's like, read this, you might have to deal with it in the future. You know, the aliens are coming. <laughs> yeah. that, that's interesting you say a dark take because I didn't feel that so much. Um, the, the villains of, of that first story arc as the insects, they, they were a great villainous uh, breed, mm -hmm. but, but there's, you know, Captain Victory and his rangers and, and this idea of this uh, protective battalion, um, you know, I, I guess they're pretty ruthless, but, but I, I saw it as a balance of, of good and evil in, in the universe, you know. Yeah, and that is kind of like Star Wars. And when I say a dark take, I mean, in terms of Kirby's view of aliens, not coming here to be friends, but coming to, and that's how you have the good versus evil. I mean, it, for Kirby, it's still very light. It's probably some of his lightest work in terms of, his, it's more like his earlier work from the 50s where it would be more humor in it. Like, um, oh, geez, I'm, I'm not blanking on the, um, the Patriot one that he did in the 50s. Anyway, uh, but it was more like that, I felt. Fighting American? Fighting American, thank you. There were a lot of those like Captain America clones, like what is it, like Private Strong or whatever. Um, I felt like Chris would like this because, I mean, you brought up the, you know, the earlier work and I was thinking this looks like his like early 60s Marvel Monsters anatomy. Like look those beefy hands and like mm -hmm. muscles where there shouldn't be muscles. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. There are certain techniques that Kirby used throughout his career. Like he stopped using circular panels in like world war like or in the golden age you know mm -hmm. and then he brought those back in the late 80s like you even see it in superpowers what made him come back to that specific technique after all of these decades like what was it you know um captain victory just seems like a mashup of all of his eras a little bit like 40s war books early 60s monsters a little bit of superheroism but like with the cynicism of the 70s and then him still working at his war trauma. And all, all the cosmic Kirby, you know, the, the costumes, uh, the, all the machinery and uh, vehicles and things. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting what, what you bring up about that because I, one thing I noticed, we, we had talked previously about how he'll start with a one page spread and then you open it up to a two page spread but we didn't talk about how other than that, he's pretty much a six grid, you know, six evenly spaced sized panels. And if, if, it's, if it's an exciting page, he might do a four page grid. This one, I, I noticed some pages with a lot of panels and uh, it, it wasn't just following, you know, that, that straight geometrical six grids every page. So, so you're right that he, he was starting to break out of his, his kind of usual uh, fall, fall into for, for layouts. Even though he used a lot of his usuals, he, he, he broke out and used a lot of other layouts as well. Yeah, I, You were mentioning that, and Christopher also mentioned something earlier, but, you know, about the varying quality. But there's something about those early issues where, you know, like the first issue of Captain Victory feels like it could have come out alongside like Eternals or mm -hmm. like his 70s Marvel stuff and the fact that he's working with Royer makes me wonder was this story made at least issue one was it made before you know 1981 did they it just hold on to it it was okay. yeah actually um he and Mike had worked on it in the mid 70s I believe it was or late 70s mm -hmm. and they had a um an entrepreneur that wanted to publish that under Jack's own imprint and that fell through. So the book kind of sat and he tried to shop it around, but nobody was interested. So that's why you have, it was supposed to be when he couldn't get someone to publish it, he wanted to make a graphic novel out of it and couldn't get it published. Mm -hmm. So he expanded that into two issues when he got picked up by Pacific. And he was thrilled about that because now he owned it and he was going to get royalties on the copies that were sold and he was paid up front. 
So this was great for Jack. For, so finally, he was being recognized and finally, not only recognized, but it was his work versus somebody else's. But yes, it was done a while back. And that's why we don't have Royer on the rest of the issues is that he went back to work at Disney. And Jack always wants to work with the same person all the way through. And that's just yeah. the way he wanted to have his books done. So that's why T.B. was picked up, who he had worked with as a kid. Mm hmm. But yeah, it is older work, actually. Yeah. And you brought up that he wanted to print it under his own imprint. It's not an issue one because I was looking at it. But if you notice, like in the corner somewhere, it'll say like Jack Kirby Inc., you know, uh -huh. <laughs> like he has his own label, which is, you know, why mm -hmm. not? Yeah, that he, was the he idea. Was, he was clearly sell, selling this. He, it, it felt to me like he he was pitching like we do now where it's like well yeah it's a comic book but it'll make a great cartoon it'll great make a great movie it'll make a great toy line it'll it'll make a great video game you know that that's the feel it had to me and um this is kind of funny eric larson posted on facebook recently in in the jack kirby page mm -hmm. uh a a captain victory pitch from 81 and it, it has a lot of these uh pictures that, that were in the back that, that we're talking about, you know, that sort of uh, like, like this kind of stuff, you know, where it's like, these, yeah. these are the people of this universe and these are the weapons they're using. And th these are the, you know, the, the uh, insignias. And so Eric coincidentally posted this thing. And um, so it, it has a bunch of the, the original art of that, but he also posted the, the actual pitch I assumed that Kirby was sending around to try and, you know, get it published. And uh, it, it, if I can read just a little here, Star Wars comes to Earth in this format. Captain Victory and his crew are in pursuit of aliens who represent a beehive society which fastens itself to occupied planets and transform them into hollow balls crisscrossed by vast networks of tunnels to accommodate the activities of these insight like humans. And it, it goes on from there and it gets a little more kind of weirdly Kirby philosophical in the way he talks about things that that's kind of, you're not sure maybe what he's saying exactly, you, you know? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it, it's really interesting to see though, how, how that all came together to be this comic. And, and Christopher, that's really interesting what you're saying about uh, it, it being started years before, because when, when Thibodeau picked up the art, it did feel like there, there was a big jump. And I, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what it was exactly. And some of it was the line quality, but mm -hmm. it, you're, you're right that it, it just felt like we kind of went, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it was tough for Thibodeau too, because I read that uh, he would be getting a page and it would take him about three days to ink it. And towards the end of the series, Jack was still doing work for animation. He was doing all those other gigs. So he'd start sending several pages at once to him. And he was still young and new at doing this. So it was becoming a bit overwhelming. And I think that was part of the reason for the varying quality, because he had difficulty keeping up towards the end of the series. And I wonder if Jack knew that Pacific was coming to an end, although I did read in the special that they had planned to do another Kirby series, kind of like what they did later on with uh, Tops, where Jack would kick off the first issue and then somebody else would take over. Um, so they had future plans, so maybe it wasn't that, but he was really increasing his output for whatever reason and just knocking those books out, and I think it just overwhelmed the anchor. Yeah, the impression that I get from Thibodeau's pages, and I get that some people, you know, are like, oh, I hate his stuff, but we're here for individual thought. You can have your own opinion. <laughs> um, you know, everyone loves Royer. Like, that's usually people's go-to Kirby Inker, but I don't necessarily, you know, hate with air quotes Mike Thibodeau. Uh, when I look at his work, I kind of see that he compresses Kirby's art a little bit, not in the sense of, you know, Vince Coletta erasing actual lines and then like inking over it to just like get his deadline finished quickly. But it feels like a visual shorthand. Like it feels kind of shorthand. The lines are a little bit bolder sometimes. Um, it just feels like his lines take up more space. Christopher, you, you mentioned quality varying and um, 
we, I, I, I was uh, interacting with, with Eric Larson a little while we were reading this and he, he mentioned similarly that uh, there, there were quality issues for him. Um, overall, I did not feel that so much. I, I mentioned that there's a hiccup in, in the art style and, mm -hmm. and that did hit me a little bit, but I, I thought that uh, there, there was a lot of great stuff in there. I, I, I guess every now and then there, there would be a panel where, where I would say, oh, these, these machines somehow just aren't as cool Mm -hmm. as previously but i i couldn't always tell that it was necessarily the inker and one one big thing in quality i noticed and i don't even know if it's a quality thing but um if you flip through most jack kirby work whenever he shows people you you either have the the head-on face you know or, or maybe at an angle or maybe like just the eyes yeah. right and uh and then sometimes you'll periodically have this this shot uh from from behind mm -hmm. you know like this this one um where you you kind of see you know back here just the tip of the nose uh so that that person can look on at the person who's head on <laughs> and then every now and then you you'll have a, a an absolute side view you know like if two people are talking to each other so you can see their noses pointing to each other and i feel like that's pretty much the the variance of uh face compositions in kirby <laughs> in in you know decades of of his work you know through the 60s 70s 80s this book had uh, a bunch of three-quarter shots and whenever i saw these three-quarter shots i thought these don't quite look like Kirby <laughs> and I I wondered in in those shots if if maybe they're they're kind of hashed out and and if Thibodeau was kind of tasked with fill, filling in uh this this work mm -hmm. um well while we talk more I'm, I'm going to see if I can find an example of this yeah. To, yeah, to show I, I... you I saw that with some of the faces, especially in the later issues, that they looked a little distorted or not quite symmetrical. Yeah. Can you guys see this one here? Yes. Yeah. A, a lot of them look kind of like that, where it's like, it, it's kind of Kirby-like, but it, it's just, some, something feels kind of funny about it. And and I, I felt like those started popping up a lot. And it could be also that Kirby was just starting to try that angle more and i i know he was getting older <laughs> and so maybe maybe that was uh his his art and and i i just was surprised by it similar uh shot to how you were saying that the circular panel kind of took you by surprise that he he started going back and using those yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys, to bounce off of what you were saying, I don't know if you've read or reread Superpowers recently. It's um, been a while. Yeah, that's a book that bums me out in terms of Kirby. Like, you know, it's him coming back to play with his new gods and fourth world characters. But at the same time, it was like for toys. So mm -hmm. um, uh, during that time you see his kirby machines and everything and like you were saying it it's in the mid 80s it doesn't feel like kirby machines it feels like there's something different going on um and i'm aware that as kirby got into the late 80s and you know early 90s even up until like the phantom force stuff thibodeau was kind of the guy if kirby worked with him would kind of have to pick up the slack i guess mm where even once Jack died, Thibodeau just carried on with Phantom Force. You know, you can kind of see that Kirby influence in there. Like, it's like he inked Kirby long enough to be able to kind of, like, do his own version. Um, so I can totally see it. In those last few issues, and this isn't something that I've read anywhere, which is, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it does feel like Thibodeau is pulling, you know, you know trying to do more kirby you know trying to kind of like pick up after kirby maybe he's aging maybe he has a lot of projects going on but 
um i feel like it does look different for a reason like something like this that's you know that's a kirby face but it's like kind of not a kirby face Mm -hmm. you know if that makes sense it just feels uh not sloppy it like you can just tell that it's not fully kirby that's the strange thing about the art there are places where i think it falls down and yet in the same issue i'll see pure kirby stuff that's fantastic like the uh, electropoid that planet eating yeah. organic creature and the uh, the ranger center the hand with the eye yeah i mean that's pure kirby that was great i thought that, and, and that same issue i didn't like some of the faces but that was that was wonderful perfect i think in terms of you know skill and kirby isms the first five or so issues are probably the strongest Mm -hmm. uh you can look at those and that's like what was that one suit of armor called where they're building in the ship and it's like 30 feet tall and it's designed to like destroy planets it's like a (laughs) man-made like death star it's like a human death star um stuff like that is great it was Uh, like shogun warriors to me (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know you, you you uh yeah it's this whole you know, the, the guy marches down the hall and goes down the elevator yeah. and climbs in, gets suited up. And then this this amazing, you know, whatever it was, I can't remember if it was a full page or a two page splash. And then it's followed by all the destruction and you get a two page splash there. Yeah, it was, it was just gorgeous. There's some uh, Star Trek in there too. Like there's a lot, the, the exact line is take me up and there's a beam taking him up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I thought interesting was the origin was at the end of the series, that yeah. three-part origin versus the beginning. And I wonder why he did that, why he didn't start. I mean, I think it was better that he started the, the way he did, but I wonder why it was at the end versus at the beginning. I uh, I have a theory on that. And um, the the first story arc where it's these galactic rangers who are fighting insects who are out destroying the planet. Um, I, I believe he read Starship Troopers by uh, Heinlein, um, which is about these galactic rangers who fight these insect creatures. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this, this was a book from 1959. And uh, it, it was, I, I believe, a, a pretty huge, uh, you know, popular book of the time. Uh, the book kind of was more focused on the politics of, um, at, at the time, you know, the Cold War, where, uh, you know, Russians had bombs and Heinlein was, was kind of at, at the right of politics and, and felt that we, we should, that, you know, these, these people are evil and, and we need to nuke them. We need to take care of business. And, and so he had some fairly extreme uh, views about, uh, you know, the military. And it, in the book, it was controversial that uh, if, if you, if you uh, were in the military, then you had the right to vote and, and, you know, things like this. Mm -hmm. And, and so the book spent a lot of time dealing with the sort of politics of what it means to be this strong military force. And it's your job to take care of business. And, and then they went around the universe, you know, make, making sure that things, things went along the, the straight and narrow and, and yeah, there were these insect villains. And um, so my theory is, Kirby knew this story and thought that's great. We don't want all these politics in there. We just want soldiers fighting insects. <laughs> and so he he kind of took that aspect of the story and uh and handled it just great in in you know Kirby fashion. Yeah. I but mean, I, you... I oh no, go ahead. I I, I was just gonna finish by saying I I I I suspect that 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 was kind of his story. And then from there, as the story's developing, especially if he wrote it two years or three years, you know, before the later stories and stuff, at that point, he he finished that story arc. And now it's like, I need another story arc. Well, I I didn't get into the the origin, you know, 
um, that that's my suspicion. Yeah, and you were mentioning uh, like this whole like military force that goes around and makes sure makes sure everything is uh, all right. And in the first two issues, there's a moment where they go to Earth and they're like, Earth doesn't pay their dues to the Federation. At that point, you've never met the Federation, but you know you just assume that it's some kind of club that they're part of. But they still stick around. They're like, yeah, let's help them out. Let's, you know. Uh, but on top of that, I think it's no secret that Kirby was obsessed with sci-fi and he was always reading or like watching movies. So it's like not like Kirby's like a fraud or anything, but he's taking inspiration. And, um, you know, I, I kind of prefer that the origin isn't up front. You know, I, I like that. One of my favorite Kirbyisms is that he doesn't explain everything. You know, when he pulls out like a quantum defibrillator, you believe it. You know, it's <laughs> uh, no explanation needed. Yeah, I definitely liked it more with the origin at the back. And I read about this, so I, I probably would have missed this uh, not being as uh, knowledgeable of his New God stuff, but that he worked in some of the New Gods into the book in the origin, which I would have missed, but black mass sounds like dark side yeah. and holocaust sounds like apocalypse and even that vehicle that he's using to escape the planet is something that i think orion used something similar in new gods yeah so uh, it's interesting and i think he was just having a really good time that this was his he owned it he had full control over it now he could do things with those characters that he that he couldn't do and he wanted to tie his own work to new gods almost like really take a hold of that because that was his even though New Gods DC owned. Mm -hmm. And I, I loved the Bloody stories. Marion. I, I thought these were just so fun. You know, we, we talked about Eternals. We talked about Black Panther. Um, Eternals for me was so many big ideas that he was wanting to pack in and, and then he never got to them. This, I felt like it, it was a simple story. You know, it's, it's these rangers and they got to stop the insects and it it was super fun and then the second story with with those crazy villainous people that was a fun story like you say the origin was fun and and just all the machinery in in every issue you know i i could just stare at you know i i could just get lost in it and um so i i really enjoyed these i i i also wanted to mention something we brought up a long time ago about the the good versus evil. Mm -hmm. um, in in the Eternals, you know, we we had these villains who are evil, but then we kind of learned, well, they're kind of not evil. They're they're you know kind of people, and uh, they almost got married with some of the the quote good people, and and the good people, some of them are uh, Nazis responsible for this, you know, and and uh, this one it it didn't need to be bothered with with all that it, it just established these guys are good these guys are bad let's yeah. jump in and and watch some mayhem <laughs> do you think that's kirby just being like okay people weren't picking up what i was putting down with the eternal let's just do something more straightforward yeah that's a good question i don't know i also lied um the first five issues are not the best you get up to issue seven and he introduces these characters i forgot what their names are uh the wonder warriors oh yes so you have this guy who kills people with pestilence you have bloody <laughs> marion who's like mad harriet from new gods um Finarkin, the fearless and then there's like the cosmic fetus which yes. is his arguably his most outlandish <laughs> character <laughs> there, there were hits and misses to be sure and, yeah. and some issues i enjoyed more than others yeah, uh, and some people say, and I agree in some cases, for Kirby's dialogue's a bit clunky. Um, I didn't find that so much with Black Panther or Eternals, but there are some things in here that are, are kind of clunky. But look, Neil Adams, great artist as well. His dialogue is super clunky. Uh, mm -hmm. But but <laughs> Kirby has some great ones in here. And I, I for you of them, I wrote down like uh, in issue 10 where Taryn says, I say bull chips in your cereal, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I totally missed that one. <laughs> um, what in solar soap suds is it? <laughs> this is the sequence we were talking about where yes. he, he suits up and he he goes down the corridor 
in, into the big place. Why and, does and it look like, better with, on your copy? What the hell? <laughs> and then, yeah, th these are just gorgeous sequences yeah. to me. And then the, the destruction that, that goes, you know, for pages. Yes. It, it, it reminds me of Watchmen, you know, when, yes. when you get to see those pages and pages of destruction. Those scenes of planets blowing up, as corny as the sounds, are some of my favorite parts of this book. Like, I don't know how <laughs> someone can have fun drawing rocks, but Kirby was clearly having it. Um, yeah, there, there are so many great moments. Like, back to the cosmic fetus thing, another one of my Kirby, one of my favorite Kirbyisms. I have so many favorite Kirbyisms, clearly, is Quadrant X. You know, you know, Kirby worked on the story if like the monster is from planet X or, you know, you go back to, uh, you know, challenges of the unknown, uh, the 60s monster comics like Groot, the monster from planet X, Kurgo from planet X from Fantastic Four. It's just this mysterious planet X that keeps spawning these like <laughs> monstrosities. Uh, I just love that that's Jack's go to for you know cosmic anomalies this this was something i kind of got a kick out of Ursa on the unclean you know yes. he, he yeah. grabs somebody and then he stares at him and and talks about how oh no they're they're disintegrating and then at the end they show that he's disintegrated them and that happened in i think three different comics the exact same thing and it, it you know so so on the one hand it's like well it happened in last issue and maybe someone didn't read last issue. So we, we got to reestablish to make sure people understand how dangerous he is. On the yeah. other hand, it reminds me a little bit of uh, that, that movie Waterworld where Dennis Hopper had the patch and he'd say, and it's because I lost my eye and they'd show the <laughs> eye. And then, and then 10 minutes later, they'd show him again. He'd say, and did you happen to know I lost my eye yeah. and show it a second time? And <laughs> I think they do that exact same thing in Captain Victory too. Like there's a scene where he gets his eye stabbed eye. out. Yeah. yeah. And like for about two or three instances that he's like, I was maimed, not brutally murdered, soldier, calm down. And there's like blood. <laughs> it's only a flesh wound. Yeah. Tis only a flesh wound. <laughs> Yeah, those um, disintegration scenes, I like the perspective is you don't see it taking place. You just see the result. What you're really focused on is the villain and his reaction and his sarcasm and his, his sixth sense of humor. You know, oh, no, oh, sir. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, oh, smile. It'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. It's his reaction that's the most important thing. And they, they keep reestablishing how sick this individual is. How do you guys... Another... Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, there was another scene. I can't remember exactly... I think they were passing through maybe Quadrant X, but they're they're all distorted. Their faces are all distorted, and their their bodies are getting all messed up. And that I thought that was pretty uh, interesting work for Kirby doing something like that because that really I think stretched what he could do. Mm -hmm. Do you recall the sequence I'm speaking of? It's towards the end of the yeah. series. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, do you remember the exact issue? I'm afraid I don't. I didn't okay. put down a, a write down which issue it was yeah. exactly. So it, it, it started because they, they had found this creature. Right. Was, oh, yes. Yes. Who was distorting in, in our uh, universe. They were from and, another dimension. And so, yeah, right here. Mm -hmm. This is, this is uh, our hero being distorted. And, uh, and th this was another, you know, beautiful... That, that's followed by a two-page spread as they go into this distorting universe. And then that's followed by a second two-page spread. Is that the hand? Of, or I, I think that was a different creature. Yeah. And then here, here is them all getting distorted. That's amazing, yeah. Oh, that, that brow, that like drooping brow. Uh -huh. is yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> um. How do you guys feel about the backup stories in this? You know, the, the goozle bobber and. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that. Uh, I mean, it, it, it reminds me of, again, of Jack's older stuff that was more humor based from the 50s. Um, 
I don't think it fit too well. Yeah. <laughs> it was just really weird. It was interesting. I will say that. <laughs> At least they mentioned it in the main story. Like they yes. will be like, hey, the, that Goozle Bobber is still missing. And then they would immediately move on. To say about those backup features, first of all, it it harkens back to what we were saying about how he's pulling out all his old techniques, you know, with, with the journey into mystery uh, stories of Asgard where you know you you get a little behind the scenes insight uh on on something that's going on and, and then those characters do kind of cross back into the story in interesting ways and i i felt like he was kind of doing an attempt at that and and like you say it was it was cool that oh that that gave us sort of a, just just sort of a a, a byway into how this group of galactic rangers are collecting specimens over the years or centuries or whatever, and, and they've got a room full of them. Um, but that said, I, I think humor is something that uh, dates quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I have my suspicions about Kirby's sense of humor that it, it maybe wasn't even that funny back then. You know, but <laughs> you, you look at cartoons back then. And it, it, they're so funny, you know, yeah. but they're they're not funny at all. And like, you, you can watch a, a funny cartoon from the 80s and not laugh at all. And yeah. like, I, just, just the other day, I was joking with my wife because I was in the kitchen cutting onions for dinner. And I said, I can think of four scenes from sitcoms where they showed someone crying and then the camera panned down and they were cutting onions in the kitchen. And then the laugh trap goes, ha, 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 ha but I've never found that funny. You know, and I, right. I, I kind of feel like Kirby's humor is a little like that, where it's like, okay, this is going to be the funny thing, but maybe his strength isn't funny. <laughs> you guys both mentioned that too, where like he's talking about, you know, he'll be doing an interview and he'll just like say something and he's like really confident about what he's saying, but then you kind of lose him halfway through. <laughs> but I love that about him because... Um, if you watch video interviews, he's just so happy. And that's like all you want for him. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, you, you can tell he's just got a lot of ideas going on in his head. And uh, so it, it makes sense to him, but how he got from here to here, yeah. he, he doesn't always articulate well, well enough for, for myself to follow at least. Well, you, you know, it's, it's funny you should mention that because there's one part in the book where I had to stop and back up it was i wrote this down because i wanted to make a point of it the looters and the vendor ship there wasn't an introduction to who these people were in the book and i'm wondering who are they what are they doing there i'm like oh okay there's they're space pirates and then we have that group come in with the cosmic fetus and everything that 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 starts to battle them but i didn't know who they were it just kind of came out of kirby's brain and he just plopped it on the page and i'm like yeah. what is this so i read it backed up and went ah now i see so on repeat reading it's fine first time you're like where are we going yeah you left without me hold on you know <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple scenes like that where something was progressing like like it, it was it was uh i i think both times it, it was like battling mm -hmm. and the battle was going on and all of a sudden i thought well, what happened to the battle like how, how did they get out of the battle and he was just like on to the next thing yeah a uh, sim similar thing Sometimes I, he would I leave always... literal characters behind. Like they would leave and then like uh, Taryn and uh, Orca would be stuck on Earth. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like... yeah. I, I always get the feeling he's drawing, you know, eight pages a day yeah. and just doesn't have time to go back. You know, it, it always says and edited by Jack Kirby. True. And that, that's got to be a big responsibility to keep track of just the sheer amount of work that he's generating because in addition to doing this captain victory you know he's doing three marvel titles and six marvel covers that same week <laughs> yeah it's, at times i i really wish he had an editor but if he did someone's putting the brakes on him and we wouldn't see some of the crazy humor and some of the wild ideas because i felt like he was really happy doing this versus having to do things for dc and being disappointed when they cancel it on him or whatever where he was you know why aren't you doing more to fit into the marvel universe so mm -hmm. here he's free 
And that's why he's probably just pouring out so many ideas that he's been holding back to find the right platform to release them and not have someone edit them and try to push it a certain direction. This is why I love this book so much. And it's like, this guy's been redefining comics for decades during his career. Let him have this one thing where he can mm-hmm. do whatever he, let him do the cosmic fetus. Let me, let him do this like <laughs> futuristic Roman society, you know? What did you think of uh, the colors in the book? Because there were some criticisms of it. And my understanding, what I found out was that Steve Olaf, he was working with some coloring techniques that he wasn't quite as comfortable with. And, and he wasn't selected for the book. The publisher selected the colorist and then Kirby fired him and got another. And, and, and Steve was okay with it. He's like, you know, yeah. I don't think it was Kirby's best work, but I don't think it was my best work either. So I understand why he made the decision that he did because he felt that he couldn't support him like he wanted to with his coloring. And so we had others come in and color. And I, I think Janice Cohen colored yes. some of his Mad Bomb work yeah. for Cap. So that was a good fit, but I didn't. it didn't really... I didn't see it as a problem. They felt it was a bit murky. It might've been the, the reproducing of the colors on newsprint. I don't know, but it, it really didn't bother me that much. It, it was a really dark palette. Mm-hmm. As, as far as I could tell, you know, it, it did not use bright red, bright blue, bright yellow, you know, it, like this is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, it actually, like even on the cover, you know, look look at how muted these colors are. Yes, mm-hmm. and uh, I I I was kind of surprised by that because I I felt like that seemed kind of modern to me. You know, um, when when coloring processes got got improved, you know, it, it it seems like it wasn't until the you know late '90s, early 2000s that that people really started. Not not using that sort of tricolor bright superhero, mm-hmm. you know, red, yellow, blue, and um, I, I'm kind of with you, Christopher. Where I, I saw some of these colors and thought, was was this on accident? <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it just didn't print well, or were, were these actual choices? Because it, when 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 earlier we talked about it, it being a darker book, I I would say the colors did make it feel a, a lot like like the universe was was much darker and mm-hmm. I, I thought that was an interesting choice and and then later on i i don't know if i just got used to it or like you say it, it was a different colorist um but like even even at the very end there, there was another colorist that started trying to you know more more 3d the colors which yeah. is also a very modern technique and i thought that was a really interesting choice for Kirby artwork. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't and care so, for it as much. Yeah, yeah. Well, overall, and I, I was looking at it too, and the paper quality impacts it a lot because it looks perpetually not dry. Um, mm. Like, uh, I think Tom Luth is the last one where it's like that one is kind of the most jarring. Like, everyone has rosy cheeks. It just yes. kind of feels unnatural. Like, it looks like it's like you've been looking at the sun too long. You look at this page, you know, and like your eyes haven't adjusted yet. It's just that for like 20 something pages. But um, my favorite coloring personally, you know, is the early stuff. Like the first few issues is like you guys brought it up. It's darker. It's a little bit more yeah. muted. It doesn't scream in your face, mm-hmm. um, but it has its own distinct personality like it uh, does i don't know it just feels like it's the most professional i agree and one of the things that uh steve did was he said he added zip tone to it Mm -hmm. to try to help bring it out so i and i think that looked really good i i did i do see that in the first couple of issues i think that was probably the best one thing i do really appreciate though that often goes unnoticed and unappreciated is the lettering by royer because they had a letter on the book and it bothered me that there were some weird hyphen breaks in words that just didn't make sense. <laughs> did, you, did you catch that? Because it, it would yeah. break up the flow when I'm reading. It's like, okay, I got to fit this into the, the balloon. So I think this person was new at it. And Kirby was just like throwing pages out there. So he was trying to keep up. 
And there were some weird hyphen breaks. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> Thibodeau letters agree. the book too, like after Royer. Yeah. So when he shows up, um, I think then they get like a a, a letter, like an actual Separate. letterer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't hate Thibodeau's lettering. It is completely. You can look at it. It's like bolder. It takes up more mm-hmm. space. Um, it's very similar to his line work. I think that's funny. You bring up about the hyphens. I. I feel like Kirby's, uh, you know, from from the New Gods on when he started editing his own work, I, I feel like those those hyphens and and quotation marks on weird words and and, and emphasis of weird words, like I, I don't picture someone saying something by emphasizing the word that they chose to mm, emphasize. Yes, but I, okay. I didn't notice it necessarily worse in in, in this <laughs> than than a lot of the previous stuff. I. I, I do agree, though, that like it, it would hyphenate midword because they ran out of space, and yes. then the next line. It, it so so that would kind of hit more often in weird places. I wonder though, did Kirby, because he was writing and drawing it, did he kind of write on? If you look at the original pages, is it Kirby's lettering at first, and then the inker or the letterer would see? Okay, he wants these words here, and then the inker would just put it there also because I I wouldn't be surprised if Kirby had it written out the way we see that is getting on your nerves and uh. then Royer had the foresight to make it a little more readable mm-hmm. whereas Thibodeau being new at it just kind of copied it more or less as Kirby had put it on the page I, I'm just oh, that's surmising. a good point yeah I that, wish we had theory. the pencils for those too. Yeah. I know there's like a silver. I've I've seen like silver star pencils. Um, I wish there was like a Captain Victory like artisan edition where it's like you can go and see that original lettering. Uh, maybe we should reach out to the Kirby Museum guys and see if those pages I, exist. I think there is. Is there? There is a um, like a silver edition. It's called a graphite, and I, I think Chris, that's okay. the one you may have. I'm just taking a look here. Yes. It's available. You can get it digitally. Okay. Um, and they do have the original lettering in there, and it's really hard to read. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, but like, I'm looking at issue. I believe this is twelve, and I think this is like the worst offender out of the series because there's like ellipses and dashes not that far away from one another, and it kind of makes my. I, I don't know if you guys can see it all that well, but it's it it's not efficient. You know, that's mm-hmm. not a good way to use your like text space um and i think uh chris was mentioning hey did kirby bold the letters himself um i remember not to name drop i know this sounds like a name drop but it happened uh i had a my, in my recent conversation with Anne nascente she's like when i write scripts i don't tell the artist or the letterer which words to bold like it just feels like again you're screaming in someone's face like it's like i went to the store and then, you know, um, but with Kirby it would be, I went to the, the store, store. Right. great cosmos <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but she was like, it is not like, uh, and she was citing, you know, uh, I forget who it was. I think it was Christopher Walken who, you know what, he's actually the guy, of course it's him. He's like, um, you don't write a script and like tell an actor what to emphasize and he's like and she talked about how he would take out the punctuation as well it's like you can't tell them where to pause so you know i i would love to know like what you were asking like is this kirby doing ellipsis and dashes Mm -hmm. back to back like it you know or did someone just decide to letter it like that Uh, if if, if you read a a movie screenplay there's no emphasis on words and uh i i took a a creative writing class and and my instructor said don't put that in the the reader you know can can read it themselves and think for themselves mm-hmm. where the emphasis is and, and after i took that class and went back to comics i was like oh man comics are the one medium where <laughs> we we comics writers we we just like to let everyone know where where we think the emphasis should be <laughs> Do you guys think that this book flows better or worse or are you indifferent like compared to something like, you know, the Eternals or New Gods or Black Panther? Hmm. I I think it flows pretty well because he's 
in some ways dealing with a lot less than he did with the Eternals because there were just so many characters he was kind of come popping in and out and some of them who would leave for a while. And this more focused on Captain Victory and the Galactic Rangers so and bringing in various baddies for them to fight. So I think in that regard, especially maybe like the first third of the series, I think it flowed pretty well. The, the first story arc, I thought, flowed great. The, the second one did decently the third one did okay i i felt like it, it kind of lost steam as as it went i still thoroughly enjoyed it and you know i i mentioned earlier that the eternals it, it felt to me like it needed about 50 extra issues or mm -hmm. 100 extra issues or, or 10 years or whatever they they were saying in the eternals you know this is going to play out over 10 years and then he didn't have 10 years and we just saw the first year um and and the black panther i just thought where where is he taking this character this doesn't make sense to me you know this doesn't feel like a black panther story and so re reading eternals and then black panther and then this when i got to this i was like ah this is what i i've been looking for in those other ones it's it's a story and it He's, he's created these characters and this is the story we're going to tell. It's a very simple story and we, we just take it from here to here. And, uh, you know, it, it's Rangers and they're protecting the universe. Go. Okay. Yeah. First, first problem, these insects, let's take care of them. Go. And, and so I, I just loved, I, I thought this was a much stronger story for, for what it was. Uh, especially, you know, for, for a Jack Kirby written story, because he, he can just get, I, we, we might have mentioned, he's got all these crazy ideas, but Stan Lee could say, okay, let's make some sense of what you've drawn here. And let's, let's mm -hmm. try try and put a story here. And uh, that, that was lacking when, when Kirby started doing his own stuff and being able to edit his own stuff. But here it, it felt to me like he figured it out. Oh, I see. If, if I stick with the story, readers can go along the journey with me more easily. So I, I really love that aspect of, of this particular project. It, and it has an ending, you know, it might not be the most satisfying ending, but you know, at least finally Jack got to wrap up a story without the book just like slamming shut in his face. And I think it's, it's corny. This story is corny, but in the best way, but it's also his darkest story, you know, Issue five has one of my favorite moments where it's Taryn talking about how aliens have done everything. You know, they've been the good, the bad, but never the ugly. You know, human beings are like the only organisms in the cosmos who commit genocide. And it's like, Jack, where did that come from? Um, but I think we can wrap it up there. Uh, there's so much to talk about. It didn't leave any loose endings where it's like, oh, I've got to know, like, what happened here? It, it, it told this yeah. story, then this story, then this story. And it's like, okay, we, we've got this contained and it works as as a package so and maybe that's it. why he was like really increasing his output towards the end with doing more and more pages to make sure he got that finality to it that he managed to finish up where he wanted where he wanted to finish for a change i wanted to say thanks for reading this book and rereading it uh you know i think we're getting progressively weirder like where do we go from here <laughs> <laughs>